Welcome to the series, Revelation, The Second Coming, with your host, Father Alfred McBride. This series explains the imagery found in the book of Revelation and brings encouragement to the faithful. Now, join Father McBride as he presents this episode of Revelation, The Second Coming. The last time we had a pope that wasn't Italian, that is before our present uh, Pope John Paul II, was about four centuries ago. And it was a Dutch pope named Adrian VI. And Pope Adrian, during the Renaissance, commissioned a painting entitled Peter's Bark, or the, the Ship of Peter, and hired a painter uh, to portray that. When the painting was finished and everyone came to look at it, they unveiled it, uh, this is what the Pope saw. Here was a beautiful Spanish-type galleon of the 16th century, and the ship was on a sea that was as smooth as glass. There was not a ripple, not a wave right around where the ship was. And the sails, instead of being furled with wind in them, the sails were just quietly at rest. And Pope Adrian was portrayed on the main deck of the ship with his hands in prayer and very devoutly situated. And all around him were the College of Cardinals also doing their prayers. Down below in the staterooms, there were square portholes through which the Catholics looked out at this very calm sea and this very peaceful atmosphere. However, over toward the end of the painting were waves and lightning and thunder and dark clouds and just quite the opposite of where the church actually was. The Pope looked at it a little bit and he said there's there's just something wrong with this painting because in the Gospels the ship of Peter was in the storm at sea. We weren't outside the storm. We were in the storm. But Christ was in the middle of the storm protecting them from danger. So that the idea being, as the Pope said to the painter, he said he took his, his uh, papal ring and he went over. He said, but the church... Uh, really will be here in the middle of the storms and the difficulties of life, be there with our people. Uh, all of us will be involved in such things. So do it over and make it like the storm at sea, but Christ being our peace in the middle of such storms. Well, I have a reason for telling that story as we are progressing in our study of the Apocalypse, because up to this point, uh, from chapters 1 through 5, chapter 1 being the vision of Christ calling St. John uh, to write the seven letters, and then chapters 2 and 3, the letters to the seven churches, which we've already seen, and then chapters 4 and 5, the heavenly liturgy. So that's where we've been. We've taken about 20% of the apocalypse now. And it's all been fairly nice. Beautiful scenes, heavenly music, few little faults in the seven churches, but otherwise a very peaceful and very pleasant atmosphere. But now we move, as in that painting I just described, we move from this tranquil, you know, perfectly beautiful scene to the storm at sea. And the rest of Apocalypse will have much more of that than just the peaceful, lovely scenes we had in the beginning. And it is, of course, with the rest of Apocalypse that most people are concerned. And we will today, in chapter 6, begin talking about the seven seals. And uh, before, however getting into the seven seals of chapter 6, which I hope you have read before tuning in, because the more you read and study along with me, the easier 
this is going to be. Because there's so many symbols in the apocalypse that it not like an ordinary book of the Bible that we can just read it more or less immediately understand it and then make a um, make an application to our personal lives. Ahead of us now will be the seven seals, which is our immediate concern, but also there will be the seven trumpets and the seven vials or bowls of wrath. The seven trumpets will be in chapters 8 to 11, and the seven bowls of wrath will be in chapters 16 to 18. Now, the reason I am getting into this, the uh, you know, bringing these three together, is um, that they all very much say the same thing. That is, they're all about catastrophes, the storms at sea plagues, uh, battles, killings, famines, earthquake, all of that. You will find that in all three sets of the seven seals, trumpets, and bowls of wrath. And um, I point it out to you right now because they're always in sevens. They're always about some kind of a doomsday or a chastisement. And we want to know, well, what does this have to say to the church? And what was St. John trying to say to the seven churches of the apocalypse, to our church, and to the church at the end of time? Well, there's no absolute uh, way of saying what these are all about, but we, I think we have enough hints from our study of history and our experience of history, the church now entering soon into the third millennium. We've had 2,000 years to look at these chapters. I would say one way, and the way I uh, decided to go in this series, is to see each of the tribulations, the seals, the trumpets, the bowls of wrath, each of them in a slightly different light, even though they're all very much the same in, their, in what they talk about. The seven seals, it seems to me, uh, are really talking about the presence of evil in the world and what causes it and what are the effects. So just the general presence of evil. We all, like for example, there are the earthquakes, the natural catastrophes with which we are all familiar. The seven trumpets, I believe, are much more about what hell is like. So when we get to chapters 8 to 11, we're going to talk about hell, which is the ultimate consequence of evil that is not repented. And then thirdly, the seven bowls of wrath in chapters 16 to 18, I would see them as a description of God's chastisements, uh, God's plagues, they're very much like the ten plagues of Egypt. And if you may remember in reading the book of Exodus, that the plagues of Egypt were not, they were punishments, yes, but they were more uh, chastisements with the purpose of converting those who were being afflicted. So in other words, when Moses stood before Pharaoh uh, and he said, well, Plague number three is coming. Say plague number three might have been the plague of the, of the locusts or whatever. It was not simply to punish the Pharaoh, but actually to persuade him to change his mind. And so there's a, there's a line in the Bible somewhere, God chastises those whom he loves. God loves everybody, of course. But chastisements come to us both in, uh, in different points of history and in our lives, to call us to repentance and to conversion. So I hope you've been following me. I just repeat it again because as a teacher I like to repeat things. I would see the seals, the seven seals, which we're about to take, as a, a description of general evil, what it's all about. The seven trumpets will be about hell, and the seven bowls of wrath will be about the uh, chastisements that call us back to Christ and back to love and conversion. So, with that in mind, let's proceed. 
with with this to say, the next uh, from chapter 6 to 18 is not all about these catastrophes. In between the seals, the trumpets, and the uh, bowls of wrath, in between are scenes of glory. John will always open up heaven again and say, okay, put your eyes on the one who sits upon the throne. Put your eyes and adore the Lamb who was slain and has risen. Look at the 24 elders, the four living creatures, the seven fiery spirits. Look at the great heavenly gathering and listen to the music of glory so that in between we are brought away from all of this terrible things that we see here on earth to that which is our destiny and the substance of our salvation. All right, that was a lot of preliminary statements, but I think it's important as a, as a context in which to study what we are about to look at. So then, with that, let us look at the seven seals of chapter 6. Actually, there will only be six here, and the seventh seal we will see at the end of the next, the next program in the next chapter. The, um, again, talking about seals, what we're dealing here with is the unsealing of scrolls. So let's imagine this is a scroll. And in ancient times, to keep the scroll from popping open, it used to be sealed. You've often seen this in movies about the Middle Ages and so on. You'll have some wax here, and then somebody will put the king's seal upon the wax. Now, in this particular story, there is a scroll that has seven seals. So we open seal one, and you see part of the text. Then you open seal two and see more. And finally, when the seventh seal is taken off, the whole text becomes visible. In the book of Revelation, when we talk about unsealing the scroll, it isn't simply uh, opening the book. It is um, a little more than that. It is, um, it's giving a little talk. So really what we have here today is um, not only opening these scrolls, but with each opening there is a kind of little homily being given. So I would say you could look upon uh, this section as a series of seven little talks. Of course, it's so active, it doesn't seem like a little homily. Because in the Bible, when God talks, things happen. The biblical word for word is dabar, D-A-B-A-R. So when the word of the Lord is spoken, uh, very often what is said happens. So there's a happening as well as a homily. The situation is this, that John's parishioners are puzzled by the sufferings they are undergoing. Remember the situation now. John is on Patmos, and the parishioners of the seven churches are over in Asia Minor, suffering, uh, in many cases, from the persecution of the Romans, both from Nero as well as Domitian. And they want to know... What, what is all this suffering about? What is this evil we're experiencing? And John has tried to tell them that, the, that this evil is, well, we'll see it in a minute. He's trying to show that Christ is in the middle of their lives and that he does care for them. And in spite of all that is happening, they will be brought to salvation if they have faith. We're going to see that the first four seals are related to the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, often in religious art, you have seen the four horsemen. Even Notre Dame, way, way back in their football history, had the so-called four horsemen of their team. And um, there was a book out some years ago called Approaching Hoofbeats. And it was the idea that the the four horsemen of the apocalypse are bringing uh, their particular plagues and evils. So, but why use a horse? Well, in the Bible, an ox was used 
for farm work. And a donkey was used for traveling, like Joseph and Mary and Jesus came into Bethlehem. They came on their donkey. Well, at least Mary and Mary, and Mary was riding the donkey. Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. The donkey is for travel, but the horse is for war. The horse was the tank of the Bible. And that's why you read all about these fierce horses and so on in the various warlike scenes of the Bible. So the reason why we're using the horse here, St. John using, is because he's talking about war. And that's what these four horsemen are about. Now the first horse, first seal is open, here comes the white horse. It's the white horse of war. And um, there's been a debate about who is the man on the horse. And some say it is some kind of a tyrant who is out to persecute Christians. And others say that because it is a white horse and because Revelation chapter 19 verse 11 speaks about the man on a white horse who is faithful and true, we could see this white horse as Jesus Christ and who is coming to be in the middle of the Christian church fighting with us against the other three that we are about to see. So there's lots of evidence that way that you could interpret this white horse as the horse not only of war indeed, but of war on our side, our battle. Psalm 110, which is applied to Jesus Christ so often, says, Rule in the midst of your foes. Shatter kings in the day of your wrath. And we could say that's what Jesus is doing on our behalf. He rules in the midst of our foes. He shatters kings in the day of wrath. If Jesus were not fighting for us, how could we prevail against evil? And so the New Testament church is portrayed in many ways as strong and militant. It's not a wimpy church. All right, so that is um, one possibility, that um, the white horse is the horse of war, but it is the white horse of Jesus Christ. Now, the red horse is definitely the horse of war. It is the color of blood. And we already saw when we took the seven churches about Sardis and Laodicea that those churches were afflicted with greed, we know how often greed is behind many wars. There are often financial reasons for wars. There are wars and rumors of wars, conflicts between nations. There are wars in families. There's war in my own soul. And oftentimes the conflict within me becomes a conflict outside me. And when there is a conflict within the whole people, then there's bound to be a conflict outside. Conflicts within cause conflicts outside. Wars and rumors of wars. The red horse of war is coming. That's the approaching hoofbeat, if you will. Then the third seal is opened, and this is the black horse of famine and of economic crisis. I was born and raised during the Depression. The black horse of famine was very evident. Economic crisis was very evident. We had the third horseman of the apocalypse. In that scene that we see in the text, the, the rider carries a scale. And on that scale, he's weighing food uh, to give out the little, like food rationing, if you will. He signals food shortages. In our response to the economic crisis, we should remember the church's teachings on social uh, justice and other such matters. But anyway, all we're dealing here with is, is what do these four horsemen stand for? And then the fourth seal is opened, and it is the pale horse of death. The pale horse of death. And uh, that has been seen very often. Albrecht Dürer 
had the plague crosses in the Middle Ages. Uh, Japan has an artist who has given a very vivid uh, description of the fourth horseman. He shows a human skeleton who is a human skeleton who is riding a horse that is also a skeleton across a field of bones and there's a green cloud of chlorine floating over the scene and Fujita who is the Japanese artist is portraying Hiroshima. Death is caused in all sorts of ways Ebola, AIDS, lethal weapons, the bomb and so on. What you're really seeing here in war, uh, famine, and death are the normal evils that afflict us all in everyday life. The fifth seal is open, and this is religious persecution. Because when the fifth seal is open, there is uh, revealed an altar in heaven. And under the altar are the sighs and the tears of the saints. Down on earth, we had the martyrs those who died during Christian persecutions, both in ancient times and today. But in ancient times, when the martyr was buried, the tomb of the martyr often became, a, um, often became an altar. And um, so, just as in heaven in the scene, the tears and sighs of the martyrs come from beneath the altar, on earth, the martyr is in fact underneath the altar upon which the Holy Eucharist is celebrated. That's why in all the altars of all our churches, we always put uh, the uh, relic of a saint and of a martyr if possible. So the fifth seal deals with religious persecution, which always happens. Happened in ancient times. Our own century actually had religious persecution probably greater than any other time in history. You don't have to go back to the Roman martyrs to find Christian martyrs. We've had them by the hundreds and maybe thousands today. In fact, not long ago, seven Cistercian monks were martyred in Algeria. They were just taken in and their throats were slit. If that's not martyrdom, what is? What else could it be? They died because they wanted to witness Christ in that country, in that space. And they said, we were vowed to stand here for the sake of Christ. The tears of the martyrs and religious persecution in the fifth seal. And then the sixth seal. And that's a whole series of natural catastrophes that we always read about, see on TV all the time. Earthquakes, um, well then of course the sun, moon and stars darkening, not quite except in an eclipse. Stars falling, we speak about the meteors that fall, torn skies, um, and movable mountains, volcanic eruptions and lava flows. Well, those five evils that you read about in the sixth chapter are all found in other parts of the Bible. The earthquakes are found in Ezekiel 38, the sun, moon, and stars in Isaiah 13, the stars falling in um, the, the last judgment sermons of Jesus, torn skies, movable mountains, the last judgment sermons of Jesus Christ. So here we go all of these many catastrophes and sorrows. What I'm trying to say is this, or what I think John is saying, is that we are, we are confronted with evil. Evil which is the result of original sin and its effects linger into our own times. The people who are suffering in John's church seem to have forgotten that these many evils, these wars, famines, and so on, are common. They will happen from now until the end of time. They happen in our own time, and they will happen at the end. These many tribulations, of course, will all occur before the actual end of time. We don't know when that day will come. They are so troubling, however, 
that they make us identify with the last uh, question of this chapter, which is chapter uh, 6 we're dealing with here. The last question is very interesting. In the middle of all these troubles, who can stand? Who can put up with it? Who can endure the pressure of these evils? Who can survive? How is it possible? The answer to these questions will be found in our next program in chapter 7 of the, of the Apocalypse. We will find out who can stand and how it is possible to survive in the middle of so much evil. It might be worthwhile just noting that when we are afflicted by evil, we tend to see that as the only problem or as the biggest of all problems. Actually, um, I'm not sure that it is. Uh, what I mean to say is this. If I have a toothache, and that's the only thing wrong with me, it so occupies me that I forget the rest of me is healthy. So I think sometimes when we are facing these many catastrophes and troubles, we may forget that Jesus Christ is in our midst, I am with you all days, and that um, he is here to help us endure, confront, and overcome the evils that afflict us. The sixth and the seven seals. We'll see the other seal later. Well, now we're coming to the conclusion of this program. I hope that you have formed a study group uh, to help you uh, get a follow what I'm trying to do. It always works better if you have a few people working with you. Hope you read the next time, chapter seven of Apocalypse. It will be about joyful, joyful, we adore thee. And I hope that you are able to use and find useful my little book, The Second Coming of Jesus. This is uh, put out by our Sunday visitor. You can get it at your Catholic bookstore. Anyway, God bless you, and we'll meet again and talk about the next chapter. This has been Revelation, The Second Coming, with your host, Father Alfred McBride. Join us again at the same time next week for another episode of Revelation, The Second Coming.